What's up? What's up? What's up, everybody? How are we doing today? Happy Tuesday to everybody. It's another beautiful week. Another beautiful opportunity to do some solid work, some free solid works training. Another opportunity for me to learn how to use the microphone. I'm going to try and stay far away from the microphone today. I know I say that every week, every day, really. Uh, but uh, we're going to do it right this time. I know it. I just have such a good feeling about today. Uh, what is up, Robert? What is up, Tamborora Station? Welcome, welcome. Thanks, guys, for joining me today on this epic journey through the creation of a bass guitar. Robert says, it's Tuesday coffee. Well, Robert, cheers to that. I got my special owl mug. Makes me feel very wise, so cheers. And on this beautiful and quite cold Tuesday morning, uh, we are also drinking some emergency. Uh, always good to keep your vitamin C levels up. Especially when it's cold outside and your immune system is, is fighting that coldness. And um, don't forget, guys, like, subscribe, and uh, buy a shirt. We got the, the new Two Tall Toby shirts available. They are super soft. They are epic. I know you guys who are here live uh, at the jump probably already have done, have already liked, have already subscribed, and have already bought a t-shirt. So that's more of a message for people who are who are watching the recording. So guys, we made some really, really good progress with this thing uh, over the past few weeks. This is the bass guitar project that we're looking at here. We are viewing this in what's called a camera view at the moment. Uh, so we've got a camera set up where we can hit the space bar and we can jump to different cameras. We talked about how to do this earlier in the project. Uh, this is really helpful when you are putting together any kind of a, a graphic for a customer, for an end customer, because the uh, depth of the view is not dependent on the visibility of components. And what I mean by that is if we are viewing this thing in a perspective, for example, and we hide one of the components, the depth of the view, the depth of the perspective changes a little bit based on which components are currently showing. And so if we were to, for example, uh, let's say we open up the body subassembly. Uh, so I'm going to go to the feature tree here and I'm going to open up the body subassembly. And we're going to view this thing in an isometric view. And we are going to turn on perspective. So we go to view perspective here at the top. And we are going to go to the option for uh, view modify perspective. This lets you change the depth of the perspective. So the smaller this number gets, the closer you are to the object. If I made this like 0.3, it's kind of like I'm an ant uh, coming up on this bass guitar, looking up at this bass guitar. So that looks pretty good. And I want to do a rendering with everything shown. And then I want to do another rendering with uh, just the pickups and the electronics shown. Well, the problem is you can see that, you know, the, the shape of this pickup actually changes when I hide the body. See how it got a little bit smaller? It kind of changed its perspective a little bit. Well, that's because SolidWorks is calculating the option for view perspective on the fly based on the envelope of the geometry that's currently in view. Well, you don't run into that issue if you set up a camera. So here I've got a camera and you'll notice that I'll hide this component and everything stays the same size. The pickup does not change in size uh, relative to the screen. And so if you are trying to put out any kind of marketing or you're trying to share your, your uh, design with the customer and you want to show some stuff, like sometimes what I'll do is I'll take a view like this and save it off and then I'll take a view just like this and save it off. And that gives me a lot of flexibility to control what's hidden and shown if I've got layers in my photo editing program. Well, you're not going to be able to do that if things are uh, not exactly the same size. So just kind of a, another cool benefit of learning how to work with cameras. Uh, of course, you know, we like the uh, the regular section view as well. The regular section view looks great too. Uh, or I'm sorry, regular perspective view. And I do have a saved view here with electronics. And so I guess I accidentally clicked into that view as well to enable that section view uh, using the uh, zonal section view option. So we are almost done with the body. Um, I did a tiny bit of work this weekend. Uh, I did create the knurled nut here on the uh, on the uh, three-way switch. So I did create this component here, just a knurled nut. Uh, we, we looked at this last week a little bit. This component here, there she is in the real world. And uh, of course we've got, we've got focus problems this morning. And uh, so we've got that model here. 
in the uh, in the uh, 3D environment, virtual 3D environment. It's a it's a virtual twin. It's like the hot word that people use when they have huge uh, huge budgets. And uh, and then over on this component, you can see that we created the potentiometer, uh, which I did offline last week. And then we created a nut for the potentiometer, and we created a washer for the potentiometer. So that's all we really did offline, um, just to kind of set ourselves up to hit the ground running this morning. And so, really, I mean, I think we might be getting to the strings this week, as crazy as it sounds. Um, I thought we were going to be out till episode 17 before we got to the strings, but if we really look at this, uh, all we got to do today is create the knobby. Uh, so we'll we'll go in, we'll do that as a two-piece assembly. It is an assembly, but uh, we'll create the knobby there. We'll you know that'll just be a revolve. We'll talk about knurling on that knobby uh, and some different techniques we can use for knurling. What's up, Ali Amore? Great to see you in here this morning. We're going to create the back panel here. So we're going to punch some more pilot holes in the body, and then we are going to create the back panel with the counter uh, counter sinks, and we will put some screws in there on that back panel. We'll create the back plate with the uh, four screws in there for mounting that back plate to the body, and that's it for the body. Uh, oh, you know what? Actually, we got the uh, strap locks here, or strap... They're, you know, they're called strap buttons, usually. I did pick up a set of strap locks that I'm going to put on this thing. Uh, we are going to be giving away the physical bass guitar, so um, I want this thing to look look good for you guys. Um, we will also model the strap itself. You know, that'll be kind of a fun little exercise in working with textiles in the world of solid work. So we'll model up the strap as well. Um, but uh, but uh, I wanted to make sure, you know, I got you guys a good setup for this thing. So I, I uh, got, I'm going to get rid of the strap buttons. I'm going to replace them with some strap locks. I'm going to um, uh, model them up as well on the body. And that'll take care of the body. And then we can move up to the headstock. And when it comes to the headstock, all we've really got are the uh, machine heads, which are pretty complicated assembly. Uh, there's some gear, gear work in that assembly on those machine heads. So we'll create the machine heads. We'll create two for the right side and two for the left side, uh, because this is what's called a two by two or a side by side configuration for the uh, machine heads, as opposed to like a fender where you've got them all in a line. And so it's the same uh, for all four. Sometimes the low string has what's called a hip shot, which lets you quickly down tune it to D. Uh, but we're not gonna we're not gonna get that fancy with this design. So we're gonna create the four machine heads, which will be their own assemblies, and we're gonna create the cover plate here for the truss rod, which is basically just a plastic trapezoid with four one two three four. Uh, no, no, I'm sorry. There's only three with three little screws in it. Uh, so very simple, simple piece of plastic there for that. Autofocus always picks a face. Need to duck to show close up. Yes. Show close up. Need to duck. Oh, got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Let's try it. All right. Auto focus. Always tries to focus on a face. So you need to duck out of the view. If you want this to really catch it. I'm ducking. Robert, I'm ducking. Oh, oh it got there for a second. It got there for a second. I think I'm better off just like enabling the focus. I should. What I should do is uh, macro the focus to a button on my stream deck. That's what I'm gonna do. That's the pro move. So that's what I end up doing. That I can just quickly hit a button, go to one focus, hit a different button, go to another focus. I'll have to figure out how to write the macro to do that. All right. So that's it. That's our game plan. Uh, that's our our, our uh, overall plan for today. Let's start with the knobby. I know a lot of people are curious about how to do the knobby, how to do the knurling on the knobby. We can do this a couple of different ways. We can cut the knurls in there, um, and I'll definitely show you how to do that. But I'll probably abandon that in favor of a texture, and so I'll show you how to uh, work with a photo of the knurl and maybe drop that photo into the creation of the uh, you know of the neural texture in SolidWorks. I've also got another photo here that I created uh, that I'm going to use. You know, guys, I, I think that it's fair to say that the kind of sub theme uh, or common theme throughout this entire presentation has been learning how to work with photos to kind of ease the process of working in SolidWorks. And so I'm just going to continue that right through uh, for the remainder of the presentations. We learn how to work with photos uh, because they just make our lives easier uh, when it comes to creating measurements and, and uh, retrofitting parts and working from existing physical models. Uh, maybe what your goal is is to create a 3D part, a 3D printed part to, uh, you know, to bridge to existing components or 
you know, whatever. It doesn't matter what you, the, the application is. The point is that if you can learn how to effectively work with photos, you can uh, really save yourself a lot of time and effort. And so in the case of this photo here, what I could maybe even do, and I haven't done this before, but what I could maybe do is even go as far as trying to line up where the center is and then um, just kind of do a quick erase here to get me my center point so I could uh, do an invert selection here uh, and then delete everything that's outside of that selection. And now I've got this nice crosshair here right at the center that I know is aligned to these four ribs on the plastic insert in this knobby. And so, you know, that's going to help me to locate that image when I go to uh, when I go to put that image into SolidWorks. And just so you guys can see here, uh, can, it does work. Robert, you are a genius. You guys see that? It's got a plastic insert. Uh, that's because this thing has a compression fit. Uh, so it, it pushes down over top of the potentiometer. Here's the potentiometer. The knobby needs to push down onto it. Sometimes these things are, they don't have that insert and they there's actually a set screw that goes in from the side. Uh, but in the case of this design, it's a, it's a compression fit. You just push that down on there. Really jam it down. It's really good for the electronics to be pushing down in this direction that really leads to a uh, sustainable design so what's up josh gamble welcome welcome thanks for joining us today so um that's why this part has that uh uh extra insert that extra plastic insert in there i don't know what the entire plastic insert looks like uh so you know i'm just gonna i'm just gonna um do my best to line that up I'm going to switch back to the camera, to the uh, the view in a second. I'm just saving this thing off. Um, so this is the knob from bottom. Flatten that image into one single image. Okay. Okay, so I saved that off. Um, I know I was off camera there for a second. Uh, I saved that off uh, as a JPEG, and that way I can use that image when we get into our SolidWorks design, which we're going to do right now. So this is going to be an assembly. Uh, so one of these parts is going to be the knob. One of these parts is going to be the plastic insert. I could do it all as one. I'm actually pretty tempted to do that. Just do it as a, it's a purchase part, right? Do we really need to do it as an assembly? I don't know. I'm going to do it as an assembly. I feel like it's the right thing to do. Whoops, that was the wrong template. So we'll go new here and this is going to be part inch. And let's get our chat looking good here. Chat's gotta look good, you know. Can't be, can't be streaming here with the chat looking not good. All right, there we go. Chat is looking good. I'll keep an eye on it, guys. Christian Block is here. What's up, Chris? How you doing? Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Base time is always a good time. I completely agree with that sentiment. How could anyone argue with such a profound point? All right, we're doing this as an assembly, guys. So we're gonna do the uh, plastic insert first, and then we'll do the knobby itself um now i'm really on the fence about this i don't know if i should just do this as a single part i feel like maybe single part is the way to go let's do it as a single part and just see what happens okay i'm gonna switch switching gears here switching gears switching gears switching gears all over the place so we're gonna go uh top plane begin to sketch orient the view s key circle and we are going to create two circles here for our layout and we will use those to locate the image that we dropped in so we'll do uh our max od here we'll say that that is 0 0.7575 wow i like that number and then we can do um, an ID. Actually, we'll do a couple of circles here. So we'll do an ID for the metal at 0 0.625. And then we'll do uh, another diameter here for the plastic. Kind of where that plastic insert goes in. You could always take this and split it up into two parts if we need to. So I think multi-body is fine. So this is going to be 0 0.52. And then we can drop in a couple of center lines to help us locate that purple cross that we put in that layout sketch. 
That was not intended to be those extra lines there. Uh, exit that sketch. We will rename this to layout circles. And we will right mouse button sketch color. Change that color to something that really pops. And then we can... Hold on a second. One second here, guys. We're going to once again top plane begin a sketch. I know I'm not in SolidWorks. Just make sure that I've got the correct... Okay, cool. Doing some client work over the weekend. I want to make sure I don't show anything I'm not supposed to show. Tools, sketch tools, sketch picture down at the very bottom there. And this will be photos of base. And we've got the knobby from the bottom. And hopefully this thing is already more or less uh, set up. Remember, if you want to use this sizing tool, you grab the magenta dot first. You grab the arrow second. You let go of your mouse. And then you can type in uh, what the distance is supposed to be that you just dropped your mouse. You know, you just drop that arrow over. And then once you do that, it makes it a little bit easier for you to drag and drop that into place. But if you want to grab the corners here and resize by grabbing the corners, uh, well, usually you can't do it when it says enable scale tool. I think because I unchecked it and checked it again, it, uh, it gave me a little bit of slack there. Uh, but normally you would have to um, uncheck that option before you're going to be able to grab the corners and move the corners around. It's kind of interesting here that I'm getting some uh, uh, deformation or deviation in the photo. I, <clears throat> I'm going to kind of chalk that up to me measuring to the neurals. Uh, and I'm going to focus a little bit more on the inside circles here, uh, the circle for the plastic and the circle for the uh, inside diameter there. I think that outside diameter maybe is a little bit off because of the knurling uh, and depending on where I measured it. So I'm going to consider this kind of really I'm going to focus on the plastic circle. I feel like that one was a pretty clean dimension. Okay, so something like that uh, definitely gets us close enough to what we're trying to accomplish with this thing. Wow, it's really far. I'm, I'm surprised that it's so far off with the... I'm, maybe I uh, fat-fingered the dimension there. 0 0.75, 7525, 7575, however you want to say it. What did I do with my layout circle there? Eh, 0 0.75, 75. It's crazy how far off that is, but... Maybe the image is just kind of like yielding a weird, um, <clears throat> a weird result. Um, Aliyah Mori asks a great question. Are you using a fixed camera setup for taking the pictures? I am not this time. Uh, I have in the past. Uh, excellent question. I, I definitely have in the past used a fixed camera setup where I actually go in and, and properly level the camera so that uh, I'm further mitigating any kind of deformation. This time around, I'm just using my cell phone, which has the level built into it and kind of trying to get close. But uh, that definitely could account for the uh, deformation or deviation I'm getting in my results. Excellent question, Ali. All right, let's get the outside of this thing first. So we will go uh, front plane, begin a sketch, orient the view, and we will create a vertical line that's going to be pierced to that layout circle. And uh, then up here at the very top, we're going to create a vertical line that comes into a tangent arc like so and then we can merge these two together and we can take this point here and we can pierce it to this circle that's passing through the sketch plane we can use that view previous to go back to where we were a moment ago lots of great time savers that we've covered throughout this tutorial series and uh, that view previous is definitely one of my favorites um i think just because it's so underused uh, and so you're able just to leverage so much value out of it uh, let's say that we want the max height of this knobby to be once again 0 0.75 I like that I like when the geometry is clean and then the uh, point of tangency here uh, from center is about 0 0.36 obviously this isn't going to be perfect uh, but we can certainly try to get it close and then our uh, distance to the lower point of the knobby kind of the lower uh, where that runs into 0.666. Love it. I'm loving this numerology this morning. Features, revolve. We can revolve that thing around. Give ourselves uh, the uh, the main shape of that, uh, of that metal part. We've got a little bit of an indent here. So we can uh, hide the image. This will be called image from bottom. Move that up. And then we can... 
See, you can't select through an image and select that face. Let's see if we could do select other. Oh, you could use select other to do that, but then you don't get the uh, context bar to uh, begin your sketching. So a lot of times when I'm working with images, I spend some time hiding and showing those images. So select face, begin to sketch, orient the view, convert entities, and S key, extrude cut. And this is going to go down to a depth of... 0 0.115. And then we can select face, begin a sketch, orient the view, and that is going to be this circle here, convert entities, and uh, we're going to extrude cut this. We really don't know what the depth of this thing is down to the bottom. I mean, I can kind of kind of depth gauge the bottom of the plastic, um, and then I could just use some kind of engineering intuition, add a little bit to that. We'll say that that's going to go down to a depth of 0.611. Okay, let's look at this thing from a section view. Just make sure that it looks... That might be a little bit deep. <laughs> Again, um, uh, I have to kind of use my engineering intuition here to determine uh, what, you know, what some of these dimensions are. So, we might say that's a little too deep. Let's make it 0 0.59. Okay, that's probably acceptable. All right, we like it. We're good. All right, now we're ready to start working on the plastic insert for this thing. So the plastic insert for this thing, um, again, doesn't need to be hyper defined. Uh, we could probably just get this thing close to what it's supposed to look like, and it'll get the point across if anybody sees it or wants to do an explode view or anything. So select this face, begin to sketch, orient the view. Um, I'm going to do a convert entities on this face, and then I'm going to extrude that out to a depth of, uh, say, 30 thou for the wall thickness and not merge the results. Okay, and now I can hide the main body, select this face, begin to sketch, orient the view, and create some of the kind of uh, sleeve and ribbing for this thing. So this is going to be um, show that image again. And we'll take this geometry here and convert it. And we will create another circle here, just kind of using the image for the uh, dimensions. And um, I don't want to end up with too many uh, nested contours. So I think I'll probably end up doing that second uh, shape in its own extrusion. So we're going to do an extrude here. This is going to go up to surface, actually. So let me show that original solid body again. And we'll go extrude. Double click on the surface to go up to surface, and I'll say um, merge the result, but select the bodies to merge with, and I'm going to merge with this body down here only. So that gives me uh, my common height for that plastic sleeve, and then I can once again show that image, uh, select this lower face, and begin a sketch, and then we can get normal to and create some of that remaining geometry. So basically a rinse and repeat here, 0 0.222. Let's see how that uh, measures relative to the potentiometer. Potentiometer is at 0 0.235, so that kind of does give me that compression. Maybe I'll just go 0 0.23, just to get me a little bit closer. Uh, we'll go with our 0 0.290. And once again, we can extrude that and we can go uh, up to surface by double clicking here and merge results is checked and auto select is checked. And that means that it's gonna merge uh, this new geometry that I'm creating is gonna merge to any bodies that are touching it and that are shown. So it will not merge to the hidden body. It will only merge to the shown body. So that makes it easy to uh, you know, keep my outside body intact and isolated and just create this inside geometry here. And so we will once again do a select other, pick that face down at the bottom, begin to sketch. Actually, you know what? On this one, we'll pick the top one, right? Because we're going to do this as a rib. So select the sketch, orient the view. And here we can just drop in these, uh, these lines here. You can really just drop them in like so. You could also do one and then pattern it. Either way would work. And then we would go features rib. And remember, rib is going to go up to next in two directions. And so we would make this uh, 0 0.020, 0 0.030, whatever. Uh, kind of, again, use your engineering intuition. Say that it's going to go up to this body here. And there are our ribs. And now we can hide that image. And we can go to our appearance tab and add an appearance to this. 
high gloss black plastic is good and then we can show that outside body for the the knurling of that knob and we can say that the uh material for that outside body is the plain carbon steel that gets that material and that is how you make a volume knob for a bass guitar let's go over to our pdm system and check this guy in and then we'll start working on the knurls so we'll go check an active document oh gotta save it okay we'll call this uh this is part of kind of part of that electronics bundle uh so we'll call this one rgb 816 volume knob and check an active document and we'll add that into our vault at revision dash dot oh one so we've got our first revision a lot of times at this point i will go through and rename in the tree i kind of do this in batch so the revolve one i would press f2 and i would call this one uh main outer knob shape and then this would be uh main outer knob uh, lower pocket and then this one would be main outer knob main pocket and then this is going to be our uh, black plastic insert dash and then I'll just take all that and I'll control C and then that'll be black pla plastic insert uh, bottom face and this will be black plastic insert outer sleeve and this will be black plastic insert inner sleeve and this one will be black plastic insert for ribs so always good to uh, rename your features uh, that way when you come back later and you want to look at that thing you'll have a, a record of what you did there uh, once again we can do check an active document now it's at revision 2 even though we didn't change any geometry we did change uh, that uh, tree so that that needs to be updated could also um, certainly you know at this point at the bottom of the main outer knob we could add a small fillet here there you know there is a small fillet here in the in the physical part say 50 thou makes it look a little bit more realistic so main outer knob corner fillet right mouse button roll to end and save control s okay and uh, maybe again i would do check an active document just because something else changed there and i'm kind of like getting ready to move to phase two which is where we get in and we start adding in the knurling so for the knurling um you know regardless of whether i am going to um use the image as a texture or just use it as a guide we can get some value out of working with the image here so we would uh once again come in here create a um you know a, a a line that we can use to kind of help ourselves uh, understand what's considered horizontal, what's considered vertical, um, and that will help us when we, you know, when it comes time to injecting this image into the rest of our design. So I'll do this uh, using two different techniques. The first technique will be that I will actually create the neurals. Uh, not recommended because you end up with a lot of uh, unnecessary overhead on your graphics card. So um, this first technique, I'm going to be using this image as kind of a guide. And then the second technique, I will use the image as a texture. And we could also go online and find uh, a much more valuable image uh, to uh, tile onto our design to use for knurling. So I'll show you how to do that too. Uh, but for now, let's save this. Let's call this one uh, knurled, or I'll call this one knob. From side, neural. Okay, so when we're doing neuraling, uh, basically what we're looking at is we're looking at uh, cut ex uh, a cut sweep that is being cut in a helix and then patterned. Uh, whenever you're doing neuraling on a round part or cylindrical part, that's what you're really looking at. So you've got your helical sweep coming up through here. That's your, your helix. And then that is patterned in this, uh, then that is cut, sorry, that's cut to give you the first groove and then it's patterned all the way around in a circular pattern. And you've got your helical groove coming up through this way. And then that is patterned uh, the same way. So the challenge here is figuring out, you know, uh, 
how is this thing actually spaced and what is the the pitch and the height of that helix and an easy way to do that is just to work with an image to utilize an image in your design so that you can easily see if you're on the right track for that uh, helix constraint so we'll move this guy over here like so you know just uh, picking a plane out of the tree holding control dragging and bringing this over here to a certain distance so that it's outside of the the boundary of the design select face begin to sketch orient the view Let's orient the other way. And tools, sketch tools, sketch picture. And we'll drop a sketch picture in here. Okay, and we can once again use this uh, this little arrow here to size it if we want to. I don't usually use this thing. I'm, this will probably be the last time I show you guys how to do it. But that's how you do it. 0 0.75. And it resizes the image. And then you get to... Do this fun dance where you zoom and pan and everything. Remember, you can hold control and, and middle mouse button. That's pan. Hold control and middle mouse button is your pan. Another good, good pro tip. All right, so now we can resize this to get it to match the, the black outline of our uh, physical, or not physical, our, our digital twin. <laughs> I'm just going to start saying that anytime I'm talking about 3D CAD. It's not a 3D CAD model, it's a digital twin. Okay, uh, that gives us our, uh, you know, the basic idea of where this thing should go. We're working from an image, right? So, you know, don't don't sweat it too much. Um, you could always drag this to get the geometry to match the, the digital twin. Uh, but, you know, you basically just want this top line here to be at the same location as where the neural neuraling stops. Having that fillet on there isn't really doing me any favors, so... Uh, maybe that was a mistake to include that on there. Now we're going to go to our top plane, begin a sketch, orient the view, pick this edge here of the knobby, convert entities, and then we're going to go to features, curve, helix, and, helix and spiral. And we're going to use that edge of the model to help drive the first curve of our helix. And so we can say that this is going to go uh, at a starting angle of zero, let's say 180, we want it to be something here on the front face that we can easily see. And we can say here that our pitch is going to be, you know, whatever it's coming up as there, that 0 0.74, 0 0.75, whatever it is, uh, whatever it's coming up as is fine. But then for our revolutions, this is going to be the number that we're going to need to dial down. Let's say we start out with uh, 0 0.125. And I apologize, I, I meant to say height 0 0.75. So let's do height and, and uh, pitch here. And we'll make our height here 0 0.75. And then our pitch is going to be that. Actually, you know what? I think height height and revolution might work the best here. Okay, so now we get normal to that thing. Uh, so in other words, we get to a, a front view or in this case, a rear view. I don't know why I did that on the rear. And then we can look here and we can see, okay, where is that starting line? So if we increase our start angle here just a little bit, so 0 0.182, and um, you know, and if we want to, it probably makes sense for this thing to be passing right at the center of the um, of the, the the vertical. You know, in other words, half of the helix is on the right side here, half is on the left. That way, we're getting the least amount of deformation as we're working with this image. So let's say I move this down to like 0 0.202. Now you can see it's starting on this groove here, and not quite correct, but pretty darn close considering I just guessed that number for revolutions. So let's say we did 0 0.2 for revolutions. Okay, too much. Uh, 0.15. Wow, that's pretty good. <laughs> uh, let's say we did. Whoops. Oh, great. Helix and spiral. Height and revolution, 0 0.75. This was 202, I think, is what I had it at. And then revolutions is 0 0.15. Now I can do shift. I'm doing tab and shift tab to, to go through this dialog box. So 0 0.14 tab, shift tab, 0 0.142 tab, shift tab. Okay, so that's how you can, you can bounce between. I'm using tab and shift. Oh, sorry, tab and shift and tab over here on my keyboard so let's see here yeah that's good it's fine works perfect yeah that gives us exactly what we need for this uh cut sweep so then we could hit the green check mark and then uh we are going to select this face begin a uh, sorry uh s key reference geometry and we're going to say reference geometry plane josh campbell says shift tab mind blown yep yeah all the uh, cool keyboard shortcuts to navigate through uh, your Windows uh, Windows focus. Uh, very, very valuable. There's probably an argument here to 
I'm just thinking here on the fly a little bit. There's probably an argument here to create this um, helix on a plane that is slightly below the main model. So maybe take the top plane, hold control, and drag this down just a little bit. Let's say we bring this down to uh, 0 0.030, 30 thou below. And then we move forward to that circle sketch that we created for the helix. So this is image neural. Let's say we go forward here to our uh, our sketch um, of the helix and right mouse button and say edit sketch plane and we drop that onto this lower plane here. Now, of course, we're going to need to uh, realign the, the definition, really just the starting angle of that helix when we do that. But there's probably an argument to be made to do that because that's going to give you just a little bit of overlap on the, the helix um, as you are creating that helix. You're going to just have like a little bit down here and a little bit above. And that's usually good when you're trying to cut through a surface like this, almost like you're uh, machining the surface, like you're uh, using the, you know, what you'd see in an actual machining process. So probably good here to, uh, to do that, to have that, you know, that start a little bit below the actual geometry. Yeah, it's good. I like that. Okay, and now we can go to that uh, uh, curve and we can begin the command uh, reference geometry plane. So let's hide our image here. Uh, this is the pl lower plane for helix sketch. You can hide that one as well. This is the plane for neural image. And then that's the image of the neural. And usually I'll have these things up at the top of the tree and together to make it easy for me to, you know, make changes to uh, the hide show state of the that type of geometry. This is the helix neural path one. And this is the uh, profile plane for neural cut one, neural path one, whatever. Uh, so right mouse button, check an active document. Just give myself a snapshot of this thing at the current state. Select face, begin a sketch, orient the view. And now we're ready to create the geometry for the, the cut for the neural itself. So this is basically a, a trapezoid, a symmetric trapezoid here. Um, it could look something like this. And you could say this is going to be for construction. And this is going to be perpendicular. And this is going to be mirrored. And you want that to be going down into the surface. And so um, we want some of this to be sticking just a little bit out of the surface. Uh, the, the challenge here is going to be getting this thing to be... Um, I'm trying to think of how I would get this thing to be perpendicular or, or normal to the uh, kind of the overall circle. Can images be put into a folder to hide show all at once? Um, we'll take a look at that. I, I know you can suppress all at once. I don't know if you can hide show all at once, but I'll take a look and see if we can do that. It's a great question from Robert in the chat. So we're going to pierce this point. I just dropped in a sketch point here. So we're going to pierce this point. So this line here needs to be outside of that point, but we also want this line here. I don't know why I picked up a uh, horizontal relationship there. That was unintentional. We also want this line here to be... Um, Kind of perpendicular to the overall shape of the model. I'm not sure how I'm going to do that yet. Because <laughs> if we look at this thing normal too, I mean, I guess I could try to pick up this edge, right? And make that uh, converted. It's coming up as an ellipse. That's kind of helpful, actually. Uh, we can make that for construction. And then we could drop in a line which is tangent to that. Or I could even make this tangent to that. But a lot of times I like to have an additional line, uh, which is tangent to that ah yes that will work nicely and then we'll make these parallel and now we can start adding in some dimensions to kind of lock everything down so we could say this is going to be five thou and this at the top here is going to be 15 thou let's say get this bottom one to go hook together it's not what I like we'll say that the depth of this knurled cut is probably say that's five thou as well and then we can say that uh, this 
line is coincident to that point that I pierced earlier. And why are we flipping here? We've got where's our construction line? I think this is not quite what we wanted. Okay, we want this to be sticking out just a little bit. Say 0.002. That's probably a little bit much, considering how small the geometry is we're working with here. And uh, then we can, once again, attempt to create a line here, which is tangent and which is also parallel. Really, I want that distance to be from that line. And then let's make this coincident here and make this coincident here. And I really thought that was going to fully define my sketch. I mean, maybe not this one, but. I wonder if I could pick up like the center point of that ellipse and just coincident that too. Oh yeah, there we go. Come. Cool. All right, so now we can exit that sketch and that is our uh, profile for neural one, neural path one. And uh, remember, guys, you always want to have your, your path created first, your profile created second. Uh, that's just kind of like a excellent best practice in the world of uh, sweeping and lofting. So we pick our profile, pick our path, and we say we want this to cut this body because remember, we do have multiple bodies in this thing. And let's take a look at that and compare it to our image. Let's take our images here and add them to a folder. This will be called images folder. And let's show both of these and then let's right mouse button here. Yeah, see, I don't get a hide option. I know I get a suppress option, which there is nothing downstream that's dependent on the image. So if I am suppressing it versus hiding it, I don't think it really matters. Um, you know, for example, I could suppress this. There's not going to be any features downstream that are related to that. That's kind of the cool thing about isolating uh, and keeping your images independent is that you can uh, get away with stuff like that. So I could suppress and unsuppress all the images at once. Uh, but I don't think there's an option to hide in, at least not in 2015. They might have added it in the newer versions. Okay, so now we are ready for our um, cut sweep circular pattern. And so that is going to rip around this face here. 60. Wow, that's going to be awesome for my performance. It's gonna, SolidWorks is going to love me after this one. Let's zoom in here. Let's take a look at, uh, wow, it's very difficult to see this. So um, what you might want to do here, instead of doing uh, equal spacing, you might want to dial this down to like uh, five instances and then dial down your, your spacing between those instances until you figure out approximately what the correct spacing is. So it looks like in this one, it's about six degrees. So, and then you could rip that all the way around and see if that uh, will work for you, you know, or of course you could always do, you know, 360 divided by six and then give yourself the equal spacing. So either way, I um, think that looks good. Yeah, I like that. SolidWorks likes it too. It's like, thank you so much for giving me that. That performance hit. I'm so happy. Now, can we just take all this and uh, mirror it? I don't think we can. <laughs> just curious. Can we? Maybe we can. I thought I was going to have to do a second uh, second cut sweep. I like this song. It's a good song to let SolidWorks rebuild to. Remember, this is a great opportunity while this is rebuilding to like, to subscribe, and to order a t-shirt if you haven't gotten one yet. The new Too Tall Toby t-shirts are made of the softest material found on Earth. This is probably why aliens are going to come to the planet and take over so they can get a hold of this material. It'll be uh, our turn to star in the Avatar story. 
Sweet. Neurals. Got ourselves some neurals. Temporary Station says, maybe a save would be in order. Yeah, I like that. All right, let's suppress. I'm going to start using the suppress the folder now. Okay, and we can hide this. And this would be uh, neural sweep cut one. Uh, neural circular pattern. Circ pattern. And then this will be neural. <laughs> Thought I was going to crash. <laughs> Don't forget, if you're ever waiting for SolidWorks to crash, it's always a good time to order a t-shirt. It might be crashing now, Tampa Roar Station. You may have predicted the future, so. Oh, weird. I'm getting... Oh, wait, wait. Okay. It's weird. I, oh, I click on it, and it has to, it has to, like, dynamic highlight that feature and all the edges. And then once it's done dynamic highlighting, then I can uh, rename it. Like I click on it and I insta insta click F2. That's what I'm doing for my renames here is F2. And then okay, then it updates. So this will be neural sweep mirror. Okay, and we'll right mouse button check in active document, and that will both save and check in the document. So we go check in and boom. There's our knobby. That actually does look pretty epic. Pretty happy with that. So what's the, uh, you know, what's the rebuild ramification of this thing? Well, if you go to evaluate and you say statistics or feature statistics, it's got some different names as time goes on. But uh, when you go into statistics, this will show you how long each feature is taking to rebuild. So, you know, as expected, the neural sweep mirror is taking the longest. Uh, interestingly, the neural circ pattern didn't take as long. I'd be curious if I did a second neural circ pattern, uh, you know, in the other direction. Would that have um, significantly reduced the overall rebuild time here from the 30 seconds? Uh, you know, this is always a fun thing to play with. This is where you answer the question of which is faster. Is it faster to do a sketch pattern and then cut extrude it? Or is it faster to do a cut extrude and then feature pattern it? Right? How do we know? I don't know. Depends on, it depends on a lot of stuff. It depends on the end condition. It depends on what's going on on the surfaces uh, that you're cutting through. It depends on a lot of stuff. But if you want to find the answer, the answer can be found here. Uh, it can be found in feature statistics. You just do it. Using technique one, you do it using technique two, and then you can find out for yourself which one is going to be better for you and your team to adopt as a uh, standard procedure. Now, you might be familiar with the function known as feature freeze uh, that is available here in your system options under general. It's called enable freeze bar, enable freeze bar. Pretty cool little bit of functionality because what this lets you do is it lets you take this freeze bar up at the top and drag it all the way down to the bottom of your tree. So I'm dragging it down here to underneath the sweep mirror. And now let's say I go top plane, begin to sketch, orient my view, and I create a circle here like so. And I do an extrude cut and I take that extrude cut and rip it through all like so. And then let's say I do a control Q. You notice how quickly everything rebuilds. So control Q, my uh, cursor goes to a little circle and then it comes back right away, right? Control Q, blast through everything, you know, cut through both of those solid bodies, no problem. The reason for that is because when I enabled the feature freeze bar, all this stuff basically turned into a parasolid or a step. It, it has no uh, rebuild geometry. There's no dynamic rebuild taking place in any of anything above the uh, freeze bar. So everything above the freeze bar is just like whoosh, locked in place. What it, what you see is what you get. However, this is very important. I'm still taxing the crap out of my video card. All this this all these edges, all this curvature. Uh, this is going to generate a ton of triangles, and those graphics triangles are still going to tax my graphics card. And since features don't normally rebuild in your assembly anyway. Using the freeze bar isn't really going to help you in assembly mode, uh, but it can certainly help you in part mode. When you have a, a very heavy feature in the tree, um, you could put that feature early in the tree, you know, make that feature like we could do all the knurling on this outside geometry first, 
lock it all in place, and then we could create all the inside geometry, and we wouldn't have to sit there and wait and wait and wait every time a new feature needs to be generated and SolidWorks needs to calculate you know, the rest of the model or any time we hit Control Q. Just to illustrate the difference here, I'm going to uh, do that same same uh, application. I'm going to create a circle on the top plane and cut extrude it through all, but I'm going to get rid of the feature freeze. So I'm going to take the feature freeze and I'm going to roll it back here to the top of the tree, or I could go into my options and in my options, I could uh, go to general and disable the enable freeze bar. And now I'm going to go top plane, begin to sketch, orient the view, and I'm going to sketch a circle here, like so, right on the top plane, just like we did before. S key extrude cut. This is going to go uh, through the entire thing. I don't remember if I did through all before or blind. doesn't really matter in this case. And then I'm going to do a control Q, and now look at that rebuild circle. Around and around and around we go. Great time to like and subscribe and order a t-shirt. Uh, around and around and around we go, waiting for the whole tree to rebuild. Because when you do a control Q, you're saying, I want you to rebuild every feature in the tree, uh, feature by feature, go through the whole tree and rebuild. So feature freeze, very valuable, very helpful when you've got more features downstream, when you've got more geometry that you're going to be creating. It can save you ending up in a spot like this, especially when you habitually press control Q. Uh, it can be very useful, but it doesn't really help you at all in assembly mode if you have a ton of graphics triangles because most of your features aren't rebuilding anyway in the assembly. I mean, I say most because the only ones that would rebuild in an assembly would be features that are dependent on an in-context assembly feature. And if you don't have an in-context assembly feature, you know, these features aren't going to... Uh, they're not going to rebuild anyway. If you put this, if I put this knob into an assembly and I control Q the assembly, the, the features of the knob are not going to rebuild. Uh, the only thing that's going to rebuild is something that has a, a rebuild flag on it or something that has an in-context feature. So feature freeze is very useful uh, in some applications. It is not uh, going to make much of a difference in other applications. And one of those is the assembly. All I did there was delete that. Remember last time I deleted that? I pressed delete and it just went away and everything was good. This time I pressed delete and it had to sit there and circle, circle, circle forever. So let's look up at the top here. We see this little asterisk up at the top. What do you guys think that asterisk means? So whenever you have that asterisk up at the top of your uh, title bar, and this is not just in SolidWorks, but in any program, what it means essentially is the file in RAM is different from the file in fixed disk or on fixed disk. And that is just a fancy way of saying the file needs to be saved. So anytime you have that little asterisk up there, that's a good reminder that the file that's currently open in RAM is different from the file in the fixed disk. And, you know, how that comparison takes place is uh, it's a little subjective. Um, for example, you could just do a control Q and you would get this asterisk. So it's not like it's doing a geometry compare or anything, but there are uh, significant activities that can cause this little asterisk to show up. Generally speaking, when it does, the file in RAM is different from the file in fixed disk. So whenever you see that, it's a good reminder to control S, which is save. It's a good reminder to check in active document to add this file to the vault and I am feeling very happy with this knobby. Let's click on an edge of the knobby. So, actually, you know what? I don't think I have a corresponding edge on the nut. I was going to say I could do a mate reference and drop this thing right into place, but I don't have a corresponding edge on the nut. So, I'm going to pick on a face of the knobby. I'm going to S key, reference geometry, mate reference. Use the default, which is it's a cylindrical face, so the default is going to be concentric. I'm going to close this. I'm going to go to the body subassembly. So you see how this face here is uh, a cylindrical face? Well, when I press the R key and I grab that knobby out of fixed disk, so it's not even open in RAM anymore because I closed it out of RAM. When I grab that knobby out of fixed disk and I put my cursor over this cylindrical face of the, uh, of the potentiometer, what happens is we automatically get a concentric mate. So all I did was drag and drop that in there and I automatically got a concentric mate for that knobby. And now all I need to do is define the uh, the distance from the knobby to the body, which is usually, um, usually there's enough room for this nut. Uh, so I could probably make it coincident here and that would be uh, realistic. There's a slight gap between the knobby and the body. So I could probably make that coincident there. 
I mapped control, shift control S to save all. Oh, that's cool. If you got a lot of different files open at once, you can save everything. That's pretty cool. I got to tell you guys, there is part of me that really just likes that. I just want, I almost want to just leave that. It's, I know it's such a hit on my graphics. Remember, we can always find out how much of a hit it is by going in here to evaluate and going to um, assembly visualization. And then from assembly visualization, you are sorting your feature tree based on a certain criteria. And in this case, the criteria is mass. Whichever parts are heaviest are going to show at the top. Well, I want to I want to sort this by graphics triangles. So I go in here and choose graphics triangles, and then I click on that column header and sort by graphics triangles. And what a surprise, the volume knobby is the heaviest part in the, uh, whoops, I opened it, I launched a different program in the background, <laughs> pressed the wrong button. Uh, the graphics triangles is the, heavy, or I mean the uh, control knobby, the volume knobby, this component here is the volume knobby. Uh, that is the heaviest part in the tree as far as graphics triangles go. Coming in at a whopping 96,596. How often are we going to get repeat numbers today? Uh, we got the uh, 666, we got the 7575, now we got the 9696. I love it. It's an indication that we are doing the right things. Always good to look out for those repeat numbers. All right, so I really like that. Um, you can see I'm still able to kind of zip around in here. Uh, I think if I if I start adding things like ambient occlusion, uh, that might not quite be the case. Ah, still okay. So I mean, that's how you decide: is this you know is this a large assembly? Is this assembly too heavy for my uh, for my you know current system capabilities? Well, can you open up the models? Can you zip around? Can you zoom in and out? Can you hide and then show uh, those models without things like being too uh, uh, slow, too laggy. If you can, then you're probably fine. You can just leave that. You know, leave the knobby as is. I do like that. I do like that version of the knobby. I think I'm going to create another version where I add a texture, um, and then that way we can compare the two. So let's open this up, and let's make a configuration. Add configuration. This will be called... Uh, I'll call this one fully detailed. Neural. Neural fully detailed. I'm gonna make a copy of that configuration. Um, and then for the for the default version of the the uh knobby, I'm going to I think I spelled neural wrong. Uh for the, is it one L or is it two L's? Let me know in the chat. How many L's are in neural? One, two. I don't know. Then uh, in this version, what I will do in the uh, default version, I will take basically all that stuff that I did and suppress it. There we go. And I will create a texture for the neural. So the way that we work with custom textures in SolidWorks is we first need to create a file that has the custom texture. So I'm going to do a save as here, and I'm going to make a new folder in the uh, red base giveaway. And I'm going to call this one... Um, Call this one textures and appearances. Call this one base textures and appearances. And we're gonna go in here and we're gonna save this one as knob neural texture one. Nobody in the chat knows how to spell either. That's good to know. I'm, I'm, I'm with good company here. And we're gonna attempt to create what's called a tileable image and what a tileable image it tileable image is is it's an image that you can um you can put next to itself over and over and over again and there will not be a seam and so the one way that you can do this is you can start out with some geometry and then you can just mirror the geometry in two directions and so what i mean by that is we could we could look for an area of this neural that we think is pretty good pretty clean pretty useful um, so we could maybe take 
let's take this section here and then we'll dial in a little bit more. So we'll say image crop to selection. So that looks pretty good. Um, you'll notice here on this side that I basically got half of a neural. We kind of want that same thing on all four sides. So let's crop this thing like so. We'll say image crop to selection and then we'll finish up. Oh, actually up top here, we got basically half of a neural as well. This isn't gonna be perfect, but uh, it's gonna be close. Barry, what's up? Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Good to know. So this isn't going to be perfect, um, but it's going to be pretty close. I think I might just dial it in a little bit more, a little bit closer to the uh, neural geometry because I don't want quite as much of a devi deviation on the shading. So I'm just going to go in a little bit closer here. And again, I'm going to try and get right in the middle of this neural. And uh, that way I'm getting half of the neural. And I'm going to try and end up right in the middle of, say, this neural here so that I'm getting half of the neural Okay, that's going to be close enough for what we're trying to do here today. Ricardo J, what is up? Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Great to see you in here. And then I'm going to go here to uh, image uh, canvas size. And you can see that currently the canvas size is 80 by 104. The width is 80. So I'm going to do a control A, control C to copy that image canvas size. And I'm going to stretch the canvas out starting from this upper corner here. And I'm going to double the width here. So this is going to go from 80 to 160. And then I'm going to do a control V. And then I'm going to take this uh, paste that I just of, of the uh, neural that I just created. And I'm going to flip it over like so. Now you'll notice that I did a pretty poor job of uh, uh, making that neural shape copy there. I ended up with kind of a seam. So, you know, I knew that was going to happen and I'm not going to waste anybody's time trying to get this perfect, but I'm just trying to show you that this is how you can create a tileable image. So now I'm going to go image canvas size and I'm going to take the 104 and change that to 208. And um, I did a copy, but by the way, before I made that uh, change, I, made, I did a copy and then I'm going to bring this down like so. And so now this image is tileable. Uh, you know, the the, uh, the the middle of this one or the, the place where I took the seam on this one is going to match up with the place where I took the, the seam on this one. Uh, you know, all the textures, all the colors are going to be, uh, they're going to be mirrored. And so it's going to look good in theory. Uh, this one is not going to look good because of all the the, the uh, lighting and what's, whatnot that's going on here. But you can certainly apply this uh, functionality to taking a picture of like a wood green or a... Um, uh, like some grip tape or some bricks, something that, you know, you happen to have on site that you want to apply. You can absolutely use this technique to create a tileable image. So I'm going to call this neural uh, knob neural texture one save. That's a JPEG. You can make it any image you want. I'm going to go back into this model here. I'm going to pick this face and I'm going to go to appearance. And once I go into appearance here, I'm going to just choose that face. And then over here, I'm going to choose the option for advanced. So over here in color, I'm going to choose the option for advanced. And once I choose the option for advanced, I can say that the appearance path file, appearance path file right here underneath uh, color image, appearance uh, file path is going to be browse. And then I'm going to go to the bass guitar giveaway. And I'm going to go to my base textures and appearances. And then down here in the corner, I'm going to change this from appearance file to all image files. So all image files here. There's my knob uh, neural texture. And now SolidWorks is going to turn this into a knob neural texture dot P2M. That's the appearance file. So it's going to turn this into a dot P2M knob neural texture one dot P2M. Okay, that's fine. That's what I want. You'll notice I'm saving it into this folder here. Uh, the uh, base guitar giveaway 04 base textures and appearances and so when i hit save solidworks says hey this folder uh, red base giveaway base textures and appearances where you've chosen to save this appearance is not currently visible in the appearance folder in the task pane do you want to make the folder visible and so i'm going to say yes make that folder visible and so then what happens is if i go over here to my um, appearances there's a new folder that's been created here, and that folder is called 04 Base Texture and Appearances. And so now at any point, if I needed to reuse that neural texture, it's right there waiting for me, and I can just drag and drop it onto any model. 
So that's how you can create a custom image from a photo. Um, we can also do this by going online and grabbing a, an image from online. So I'll show you guys how to do that in just a moment as well. I'm going to go over here to mapping and I'm going to say this is cylindrical. And for the selected reference, I'm going to use the ZX reference. Oh yeah, that looks great. Maybe not quite. Well, that doesn't look good at all. I'm going to change this to surface. That looks much better. I mean, you know, we, we can see here that the uh, there's a problem with the way that I captured the image and, and like I said, all that deviation of the lighting when I took the image. Um, but certainly we can make some adjustments here. I made that surface. I'm going to make the uh, I'm going to change the scale of this thing so we can change the scale here. I think that'll definitely do. Yeah, that'll do. Let's look at our assembly. Hey, oh, that's a neural. Somebody could look at that and say, yep, that's a neural. I'm good. I can tell that that is a neural knobby. Um, that certainly would do the job and gives us way less overhead than what we had a moment ago. So the, the uh, other technique that you could use, and by the way, if you like that little neural explanation, please like and subscribe. Always good to like and subscribe. Helps the channel out big time. Buy a t-shirt if you want to keep helping out the channel. Uh, the other thing that we could do, let me, I'm just uh, in Google here. Go back to my view here for everybody. The other thing that we could do here is we could look up neural texture in Google. Um, we could find, you know, we could look at the images results. And we could try to find one that uh, is, sometimes it's good if you type in tileable. Uh, so... Robert says, this is a great tip. I'll use it for fabric textures to modeled cush molded cushions. Yes, modeled cushions. I don't know if that says molded or modeled. Modeled. Uh, yes, that's a great, great application when you want to, you know, get something that you already have the thing. You already have a photo of it. You know, you want to get that texture, that layout. This is a great way to do it. Uh, just try to make sure that it's tileable. You know, that's the, that's the biggest thing is trying to make sure that it is tileable. Um, so we can go in here to tools. We could say usage rights. We could say creative commons. That way we're uh, not using anything that has any kind of a license on it. We could uh, maybe grab something like this or something like this. Or, you know, if you're not worried about whether or not it's got a creative commons license, you could just grab anything here. Grab this one. Grab this one. None of these actually look like what I want. That's how it goes sometimes, right? See, this one would be okay. But it wouldn't really uh, it wouldn't really give you what you want. Um, so let's just go with this one here. Right mouse button, copy image, go into our photo editor, control V, expand canvas. There's a neural pattern. We like that, right? We want to uh, we do want to make sure that it's tileable. So we could certainly do the same steps that we did before, which would be we would grab one of these neurals right in the middle. Uh, we would we would try to make sure that we're going kind of right down through the middle. We'd grab another one of these right in the middle, or at least do our best to make sure that we're going right down through the middle. Image crop to selection, um, and then we would image canvas size, and we would say this is 391. So whoops, we gotta take this uh, Control C image canvas size we double it we would double it we would drag it make it tileable but let's just say we're going to work with the image we'll just get rid of this uh this it looks like it's an accreditation it says adobe stock so uh this is just for educational purposes guys don't do this make sure you pay for your textures okay uh so we'll save file save as and we'll save this as neural texture 2. it doesn't have to be square uh, depending on you know which program you're using sometimes texturing is better when it is uh, properly square uh, but in this case it doesn't doesn't really matter and then we would pick on that face go to appearance go to face go to browse change this to all image files take that second neural texture uh, say that we want to create a new neural texture there called neural texture 2 there it is neural texture 2 go into mapping i'm going to say this is going to be surface again uh, and then i will adjust the scale here until i get some neuraling that looks good uh, if the angle's wrong i could change the angle looks like the angle doesn't really matter because those ones were uh, actually you know those ones were um square but what i could do is i could say 
don't fix the aspect ratio, and then I could adjust the aspect ratio in one direction to get me a little bit more of like a diamond shape uh, knurling on that thing. This one has, a, see how it's got a seam there? Right, that's because we didn't do a tileable image. Image editor is a uh, paint.net uh, free. I don't want to say it's a Photoshop clone. It's not, it's not nearly as capable as Photoshop, but uh, it does have some good functionality and some good add-ins from the paint.net community. Um, and of course, the biggest thing is that it has the ability to add layers. So when you are trying to line up images and whatnot, you can use a second layer to create vertical horizontal lines by holding shift. So you can see your shift kind of snaps you to uh, common angle increments. And then, uh, then when you're done with that second layer, you can delete it without affecting the original image. So paint.net. I remember for a long time there was uh, web the website paint.net sold um, they sold actual like painting supplies like house paint and right on their main page that they had to have a banner that said like this is not the paint.net photo editing software if you need that go to get paint.net uh, so I always thought that was really funny that they were so inundated with people asking for the software that they actually put a banner on their home page uh, to say this is not the uh, image editing software. This is paint.net for house paint. Uh, but uh, getpaint.net, I think, is the URL to get it. And I think there's a few different ways you can get it and support the creators. And then, like I said, there's a good community of people that create add-ins. Um, so if you're ever, like, in here, you notice if I go to effects and I go to, like, object, I've got this little uh, object here that was created by this guy, Chris Vandermotten, uh, you know, I use this stuff and I hope that it's not any kind of like malware, uh, but if it is malware, you know, that's up to you to make sure that you're, you're aware. I'm not, not, not giving this thing like a paid endorsement or anything. I'm just, uh, I'm just a, a single operator trying to make my way in this crazy world of 2023. I think that one actually looks better. You know, I don't like the seam there, but I like the way the diamonds come through. I like the way it's like a very hard line there. Uh, so I like that. I think I'm going to probably stick with that one. And that gives us, yeah, look at that. <laughs> that's a knobby with neurals on it. That's all we need. We just need people to see that and say, yep, that's a knobby with neurals on it. Cool. Guys, I think that was a pretty good uh, little lesson there on creating uh, a knobby uh, in SolidWorks. Let's take our assembly here. Let's check in our assembly. Check in active document. Good, looking good. I think maybe the uh, the other thing I wanted to do today, and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna go for it just because it's a uh, it's a low, you know, low. Uh, I don't know expectation, low cost. That's what I was gonna say. Is uh, the plastic cover on the back? So let's go to our, um, you know, our workflow is insert component, new part. Let's see, I do have a plane for the body thickness, right? Yep, I got a plane there for the body thickness. So this will be insert, component, new part. And this one will be, let's see here, base body is 001. So I'll call this one RB, RBG002, uh, electronics. I'll call this one body electronics cavity cover plate very long name for that part body electronics cavity cover plate save and we pick the front plane of the assembly to get things started and then we immediately exit that sketch and in this case we are going to do a uh, reference geometry plane and then we're going to pick an existing plane from the master model layout which will be the base body thickness plane and we're going to i meant to offset that at zero at a feature and we're going to offset that at zero hit the green check mark and then we are going to select that face begin a sketch oriented view actually we're going to turn off perspective mode because that is not going to be fun to sketch or work in if we've got perspective mode turned on so we'll pick that plane begin a sketch orient the view and we will right mouse button on this electronics cavity uh, master layout sketch that we've created and we will do Sometimes I'll do a convert entities and just exit the sketch and I'll call this one um, body 
body pocket converted. And then I'll start another sketch on that same surface and I'll take that body pocket that I just converted. Uh, so right mouse button, select chain, and I'll do an offset entities. And then I'll offset this like 20 thou or something, you know, something small, maybe like 15 thou. Um, and then that'll be the actual main sketch for that electronics enclosure um, depth, you know, the, 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 the actual pocket that we're creating there. Because it's, it's not going to be exactly one for one. There is going to be a very subtle amount of clearance for that actual cover plate. It's not going to be exactly one to one. Um, and then I think I have some sketches that represent the depth of some of these different areas. Yeah, like right here, here's the depth of the, oh no, sorry, right here, here's the depth of the Electrox enclosure pocket. So then I would do an extrude cut from that sketch. Uh-oh. Why can I not do an extrude cut? Well, this is a new one. Oh, pfft. Oh, what am I saying? Extrude cut. I don't have any solid geometry to cut. It's the first feature. Okay, there we go. Extrude, extrude boss base, and then that would just go up to this point here, which is coming from the master model layout. And that way, it just runs right up to the bottom of that pocket. Okay, so then this would be called the um, cavity cover mean body. And then I would... Select that face and then go to features, uh, whole wizard. And I would create some counter sinks that are going into there. These are probably for number, probably for number six. I got to go look at the physical part. I got it over on my workbench right now. So I'll come back uh, in a second. So to be here. And then this is going to line up with these one, two, three, four mounting holes that we put into that master model layout. Again, very useful to have the sketch color for that master model layout a little bit different. Um, don't think I need any head clearance on these ones, but I think I do want, uh, let's go up to next. I think I do want this diameter to be just a little smaller. Number four. Wow, they're even smaller than that. Did not expect that. I'm going to have to, like I said, I'm going to have to look at the physical parts to get get that shape correct. But let's say let's say that's correct uh, just for sake of, uh, sake of time here. And so now that we've got those in the correct spots, now the other thing that we could do is we could exit. So that's for number two. So we could exit this, and then we could put the pilot holes in the main body here. So we could do edit part, and we could say that we want to pick this face and we could say features, whole wizard, and this is going to be the pilot holes here for number two. Crazy. Wait, is that right? I go in the wrong way here? It's just different? <laughs> Looks like way bigger. Gonna have to come back to this. Oh, you know what? These are... Yeah, I am in the wrong spot here. I just did that as a straight hole instead of a yeah, threaded hole. There we go. Much better. And then for the depth of those, we'll say that's going to go to, I don't know, 0 0.375. They're not very long, those screws that go on that cover plate. Okay. That looks good. Exit that part. We could do view sketches to hide that master model layout sketch. And then we could drop in some toolbox, do some toolbox action here. So we'll go toolbox, ANSI inch. Um, these are probably going to be machine screws because they're so small. Countersunk machine screw. Drop this in here. That's not the direction I want. There we go. I pressed tab there if you ever have a a meat reference which is what toolbox is using and it's going the wrong direction you can press tab that i usually let you flip it and we will make these at a length of 0 0.5 as well and then we could drop in uh the remaining three or we could just hit escape at that point and we could say uh, we want to do assembly i want to say this is going to be a 
pattern driven component pattern and the driving or sorry the component to pattern would be this and then the driving feature would be the whole wizard and that gets our screw in all four places and, and we only have to worry about the one to line up and I think this is like a black plastic so we'll go it's nice you have to do some plain auto sizing stuff to get everything to, to show up in the correct view um, this is going to be hidden uh, this will be offset zero from master body thickness and then this is going to be ABS and then we'll make this out of like a soft plastic I like that save and we'll do a check in active document here so that we've got this electronics enclosure cover set Oh yeah, that looks great. That's exactly what it looks like. Um, let's see here, we did run into a weird, it's very interesting that a mate, I dragged this part in and then a mate issue occurred on the cover plate, the washer and the potentiometer. I'm not exactly sure what that's all about. Do a control Q first of all, just to make sure that it's not That's kind of interesting. It's the surfaces here is problematic. The surface trim is problematic. Wow, this is a. Uh... It's because I offset that surface at zero from all those faces, but I didn't manipulate any of those faces. I mean, I did punch a hole through some of them, but that shouldn't be. Surface offset at zero. Now it says it's missing a face. Oh, and that's what the potentiometer is mated to. Hmm. I don't know if I like that too much. That seems a little, little lame, you know? It's nice when you have a surface trim that you have to edit, you have to like unselect the sketch and then reselect it. good because it's not even showing up and then you'll be able to remove wow, all that just because I punched holes in the that seems pretty Probably another sketch plane issue. You know what this is all about? Is it, it's all about that paint that I created. That paint is going to end up being the bane of this entire project. <laughs> all right. Wow. So all that stuff is. Uh, it must have been mated to the surface instead of the uh, yeah okay. it must have been made to that surface that I created instead of being made to the actual part which is the paint which is um, like I said I, I, 
I keep knowing that this is going to be... If there's one single thing I could change about this project, it would have been to maybe uh, adjust my strategy for how to show the paint. But I got to tell you, it looks so good. And it looks so good in all the renderings and the marketing output that I'm doing. So um, it'd be hard to, you know, hard to walk away from such a win now. All right, guys. That's what I wanted to do today. We did it. Thank you guys so much for being a part of this journey. Uh, I feel really good about how that electronics cover came on. I feel really good about how that knobby came on. Uh, we now have a simplified and a uh, advanced version of the knobby. So at any point, if we wanted to show, show off our knurling skills, we could do so. But if we wanted to get the uh, max uh, performance from our SolidWorks, we can just use that image that we brought in. Uh, make sure that you purchase your images correctly. Of course, uh, I'll have to delete that and, and get a, a proper image at some point in the future. Uh, let's see here. What else we got? We got our master model, our master overall assembly. We want to make sure that we take a moment and check in active document. Make sure that everything is going in here at the current version so that at any point in the future, we can go back. Oh, one thing to note about the, uh, the use of a PDM system is the... Uh, I'm just making sure everything is in the correct project. Yeah, is that when you when you do have a PDM system, something else that's kind of cool is that you can do a um, view through e drawings to view the actual uh, historic record of the project. And so what I mean by that is, if I go to any one of these files and I go to document information, you know, I showed this before that we could view, uh, we could we could take a view and we could look at this thing from. A, uh, an earlier revision, but you can also use embedded software like eDrawings to look at this thing from an earlier revision. And so that actually gives you the ability to measure and to, um, you know, just to look at the thing in 3D and, and discuss it. If you're doing like a design review with somebody, if you wanted to talk about kind of what the evolution of this project was, being able to do so in eDrawings is quite powerful, quite beneficial as well. So just another, uh, another benefit of a PDM system. It's not only the ability to view it, or to open it in a, you know, view it as a 2D image or open up a snapshot of the model from an earlier version. But you also will often have the ability to 3D view the model uh, from those earlier versions and, uh, you know, just kind of keep a running record of that model in all those earlier snapshots. So uh, love data management systems. Doesn't have to be PDM, doesn't have to be SolidWorks, just whatever 3D CAD system you're using, make sure that you've got a good data management solution so that you can keep a record of everything you've been working on uh, without having having to like save as pack and go da, 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 all these different stuff like sometimes you want to be able to branch and merge you want to like kind of go off and examine a new idea but then you want to come back and like abandon ship uh, while the project keeps moving forward over here you're over here investigating that's called branch and merge uh, that'll uh, that'll definitely be beneficial as well in any PDM system. So look out for that kind of stuff if you're trying to get uh, into into CAD or into PDM for the first time. Thank you guys so much for joining me today. I think this was a great session. We got a lot done. We got everything done that I wanted to get done. The bass guitar is looking great. You know, what else do we need to do? Not too much, right? What do we got to do? We got to do the strap locks or the strap buttons. We got to do the uh, neck plate and the hardware for that. And then we get to start making the machine heads making those uh, the gearing for the machine heads and the uh, cover for the truss rod. And after that, the only thing that's left is the strings, which is kind of like the uh, coup d'etat, if you will. Um, it's something that a lot of people ask about, like how do you get strings to look good on a guitar? Um, it's a lot of work. You gotta, you gotta basically create a path that starts down here, goes all the way, you know, goes up over the saddle, goes all the way down the base to here, comes right through this little uh, groove in the nut, goes to the machine head and then starts into a helix. And most of the time, at least on bass, strings actually, um, they, they'll, it'll come down here like this. It'll wind around in a helix uh, maybe two times. And then it does a 90 degree bend. Uh, so when it goes into this hole here, it does a little 90 degree bend. It's not actually that long, a little stub there. They stick down into the hole. And so, you know, we're gonna try and model all of that. And at that bend, there's going to be a radius and all these locations are going to be a radius. The helix is going to have a radius. So um, it'll be cool. It'll be a cool little lesson on using uh, composite curves and uh, fit splines and 3D sketches and all kinds of cool stuff. So a wrapped string would have a boatload of triangles. Yes, that is true, Robert. Uh, on an actual string, you have a, a, it's basically a helix following a path. 
So there's different types of strings you can get. Some guitars have what are called nylon strings, um, but most electric guitars on their lower strings and most basses on all their strings. It's actually a helix kind of wrapping around the string. You see how the string has grooves there? It's actually a helix uh, that starts at the bottom and wraps its way all the way up, and that's why you can get this kind of like, that's why you can get that sound. You can get a cool sound if you do a pick slide. I don't have a pick up here, or else I would I'd do a pick slide for you guys. But you can get that cool sound because it's actually a helix that's wrapped all the way up and around. We're not gonna do that. We're just gonna do it with a texture. Because uh, we learned all about textures today, and textures are cool and they're useful. And uh, texture can be output when you do a pack and go as well. It's probably a, a good final thought here on the whole texture thing. When you go file, pack and go, you can um, you can opt to include your custom decals, appearances, and scenes. Custom decals, appearances, and scenes. And so if I hit that check mark, then SolidWorks will do a refresh and then the image that we created will be included here. Knob, neural, texture will be included there uh, so that, you know, we can include that texture when we send this file out so that when somebody receives the file, they'll be able to open it and still see that texture. Otherwise, it would just be like a, you know, it'd just be like a blank image. So textures can be included when you output your geometry. And cool, good place to end. Don't forget, like, subscribe. Uh, don't forget to buy a t-shirt. These t-shirts are the softest material ever made. They make a great gift. They are a, a wonderful investment in the future. Uh, and uh, they're a limited supply, right? It's cool to say that. It is true, technically. There is technically a limit on the supply of things. All right, guys, have a good day. I'll see you guys tomorrow, 9.30 a.m. We'll keep going with this thing. Bye, everybody.